Hi, good afternoon. And welcome to this uh, She's Next panel on the main stage powered by Visa this afternoon. I hope you all found yourself a nice uh, sandwich for lunch um, and are installed uh, for uh, the coming hour to, to join us on stage with uh, these three formidable women who are going to talk about branding. Uh, so, as some of you might know, Visa has recently launched a program called She's Next, which is uh, focused on supporting female entrepreneurs and founders. And one of the key pain points that we've experienced uh, uh, in our surveys has been around networking and branding. So today we're going to hear from three amazing founders and females uh, around their views on personal uh, and professional branding. So before we kick off, I'd like to pass the floor um, to um, Juliette, who's on Zoom, uh, to introduce maybe yourself and your company. Hey, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Juliette. Hi. Um, my name is Juliette, and um, I'm the founder of and CEO of Gossip Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Um, we currently uh, are our um, uh, very fashionable and cool search engine in Hong Kong where you can snap a picture and then we find you the similar and the like. And we work with over 500 retailers in fashion, beauty and lifestyle goods around the world. Great. Well, thank you for being on our panel today. Next up, probably needs no introduction, but I'm still going to ask her to introduce herself and talk a little bit around her company and her career. Hi everyone, my name is Karen. Uh, I'm the founder of W Hub and Angel Hub and, and really proud uh, actually to be organizing this conference uh, as well. So uh, W Hub is a power connector here and, and the larger startup community here in Hong Kong and Angel Hub is the first uh, SFC licensed startup investment platform. Yeah, welcome. And next up, last but not least, Christy Swartz. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Swartz. I am the founding partner of Swartz Pinnersley and Associates. We're a small boutique law firm here in Hong Kong. We specialize in corporate finance, fintech matters, and also disputes. I'm 24 years now in Hong Kong and a proud graduate of the University of Hong Kong. So please, please, please don't confuse me with a US attorney. Um, I'm also very passionate about women's initiatives and the advancement of women in Hong Kong and also super proud and lucky to be on this stage with these amazing women. Great. And you also recently started your own law firm. We so did. maybe I want to kick off with you and maybe you can tell me a little bit how important is brand to you personally and to you as a company? It's a great question. And when I was thinking about this uh, yesterday and this morning, I was speaking to my assistant, Liz, and I said, oh, gosh, what are we going to talk about here? And she says, come on, Christy, surely you can talk about yourself. And I thought, well, OK, that's very true, um, because in a small startup sense and with law in particular, I think it's a very small geography and it's a very small jurisdiction. And what I mean by that is there's only 7000 lawyers in Hong Kong, Hong Kong admitted, which I am one. And also my partner, Nigel Bindersley. So you're talking a very small fishbowl of people. You're talking a very small jurisdiction, you know, depending on who you ask, we're 7.8, 8.2 people, million people here in Hong Kong. So it's very difficult, I think, when you start talking about legal contacts to law firms about being able to pull yourself away from the business and being able to say, hey, the business is different from me or I'm different from the business. Because I think obviously everyone here would admit you've got to be your own best advocate here um, for your company and for what you stand for. So I think it's uh, probably a very integral part of, of what we do and I think probably what a lot of startups uh, feel as well. And Juliette, do you want to talk about that a little bit for gossip? So do you, how do you identify uh, with, with the company that you founded as well as uh, your own personal brand? Um, I think, first of all, um, branding really goes a long way and you've got to start thinking about branding from day one instead of along the way. I'm not just talking about logo and stuff like that. It's more about the identity and who you want to be resonate with uh, your audience and what type of audience you want to go. Because the first batch of audience probably representing and goes a long way into word of mouth and to spread your brand in that way. So first of all, uh, at Gossip, when we first started, uh, we were thinking what kind of audience we want to attract. And we go down uh, to the very root of it. 
and to go back to how we 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 start our startup uh, gossip back in the day is that we are wanting to be bring it to a very credible. Uh, platform so everyone feels uh, when they go on shopping on gossip they are buying authentic and legitimate good that is actually our branding um, logo and all the fancy stuff actually come after and if we decided to go after this demographic then we work so hard into getting our merchants on board uh, are we dealing with Harris are we dealing with blooming desk are we dealing with all the big cheap names um, to to build our brand from there and now obviously uh, uh, two and a half years on now, um, I think we did a very good job in educating and, and bring the comfort to our audience and, and that's represent our brand so much. But in terms of personal branding, I think I probably uh, come along along the way like with all the other interviews where um, as Hako as the other two women here where I want to ensure um, that the female power uh, stands, especially. Yeah, thank you. I'll come back to some of the things you raised, but first I want to hear from Karen because I think what's super interesting about you and, and W Hub is that the two of you are almost interchangeable. Um, so W Hub is Karen and Karen is W Hub and it also doesn't uh, help or maybe it does that your founding partner is Karina. So you have a Karen and a Karina in W Hub. So how do you, how do you distinguish the two, or, or have you purposely decided not to distinguish it? Well, yeah, it, it's true. Karen and Karen, I, we, we really didn't make it easy for, for anyone, I have to admit. Uh, I, I think the, the thing is that a lot of people say, oh, I only see you, Karen, or I only see you, Karina. So I, I think what sets up kind of a, a part is that we, and why it works actually, is that we are very complementary. We don't have the same background. Uh, she's German, I'm French, although she's very French. And, and, and we, we really differ in terms of the thing that, that, that we do. So even in terms of, of running the business. Um, I think why people like confuse between the two of us, it's because, you know, in terms of branding, and I, I don't really like the word branding, but I would say in terms of the vision and, and the mission that, that we have deep in ourselves, we are like super passionate about what we do. And I think that's why people are, are most, like, mostly confused. And it's true that especially when it's your own company, you, you represent it, you know, especially when you start and it's only the, the two of you, right? And, and you live really by, by this mission that you want to develop and to pursue. But as Simon Sinek says, you know, it's about the infinite game. So the aim is, you know, especially as you grow, is not to be only the face of your company. You want your team to represent your company because actually it's not only two persons. Like there is a whole team behind that is really doing the hard work there. And you want them to really step forward and you want it to be so much more than, than just about yourself because it's, it's all about the thing that you want to develop. Yeah. So, so if we take the W Hub or the Karen brand, what does it stand for? Hashtag startup passion. I, I think really, you know, what, what it stands for and what we live for, it's really first and foremost the passion that, that we have for startups and entrepreneurs. And, and really when we started, we really have this mission in our head to be able to promote entrepreneurs through not only their product and services, but really their mission and their vision in order to bring them the resources to grow. Because it's all start, you know, with the W of W Hub, which is the, the why. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Juliet, I'm going to come back to what you mentioned earlier around uh, your early days of setting up gossip. Um, can you explain maybe a little bit how that process went um, when you started up and you came up with, with the brand? But obviously, you have to go out and market your company. And as founders, you kind of have to put yourself out there. Um, so at one point in time, did kind of gossip establish itself as a as a brand let's say beyond juliette uh, uh, as a personal brand because i guess when you go out there you're you're looking for funding you're looking for investors you're looking for clients so it's you that's doing all that work but there has to be a tipping point at one point in time when people start to accept and believe in the brand gossip yeah i mean back back in the day especially um 
uh, early days, right? I, I need to give. So, uh, sorry, maybe when were you, which year were you founded? Sorry to interrupt you. But uh, how was I the think it's 2017. Time flies okay. now. I remember actually it brings me back to Karen and Karina. Hashtag startup passion is actually the first thing I said um, when uh, when Gossip won the prize in at Rise Conference as the number one uh, and the champion of the startup. And I remember Karina grabbed me and say, hey, let's do an interview. And I think that's how Gossip actually established because we got so much press and he's actually got us and landed us our first seed funding and, and, and so on. Um, so at the time, um, I think like, like obviously it was very early days and, and we changed our, our, our branding in terms of logos and, and all that even propositions to a little bit. And then, and then we, we keep that going. At first, it was more Instagrammable shopping feature. Uh, and then we evolved to basically being a shopping, online shopping more, lump up all the, all the, all the um, global retailers around. And then obviously, as you said, when a founder go out to, to, to make the propositions, they look at your track record, they look at you as a person, they look at your startup passion as a, as a see how, how you are portraying because we are the most thick skinned person ever on earth and we don't give up no matter freaking what. So I think, I think in the early days, definitely um, myself become a brand. And then I, and obviously as every founder similar to me, we want free press and stuff. So we go out extensively newspaper or any, any press that we can get. And so it becomes people remember me as the brand, but now two years and a half onwards now, we are getting up to almost 700,000 monthly active users in Hong Kong. Then people kind of remember gossip and actually not remember Juliet anymore. They probably remember my CMO. They probably remember my CFO more than, than they remember me. They remember, oh, gossip, the shopping site, right? And then me, my head is no longer on the, on the, on the website as much anymore, I feel like as a, as a watermark. Um, so I think that the tipping point start when you really take up um, some sustain, substantial growth beyond few, few hundred K users. And then your business start to really take off with double digit uh, GMV uh, on your platform. And then, and then CVZ take you uh, uh, differently in terms of your, your performance and, and all that. And then they look at executive team together uh, as, your, as, your, as your growth rather than just you and the other guy as the founder, like just two of you running the game. What a memory, huh? <laughs> Yeah, that's a fantastic story. Um, maybe just coming back to, to Christy. So obviously you now have your own firm. Uh, you have, uh, I think, 12 lawyers working for you. And coming back to Karen's point around um, passion. So I know you are incredibly passionate about your work and your job and your team and, and the startup community as well as women empowerment. Can you talk a little bit how you're transferring that, that passion or the values that you want to instill in your company together with your founding partner into your company culture? Sure. So I'm going to kind of go back to what Juliet was just mentioning. So we've kind of come a little bit like uh, troughs, valleys, and, and I wouldn't say kind of troughs again, but the um, beginning was about 18 months ago, and we're really the product of a merger. It was a global merger with the firm we were at pr previously. And quite frankly, it, the branding didn't match up. The ideas of where we wanted to go, what we wanted to do, in particular myself, I'm very passionate about corporate finance, fintech work. And so I said, let's be the preeminent law firm, boutique as it may be, as small as we, we really are. Um, let's basically go out there and compete. Now, has it been difficult competing with the big brands? Yes, because you, know, you get a lot of people who say, you're not the X, Y, Z or so-and-so, and you don't have 2,000 people, and we don't have 15 different locations. You're absolutely correct. But I think what we basically learned is we were able to start and, and set up our, our basis of which we basically think our purpose, where we want to go, the purpose, and where we think we're going to be led. As you said, the branding comes later. So we had to figure out kind of the culture, the identity in, in, in our niche. Um, Nigel's very good and, and very well known in the dispute space, so that wasn't hard, was it? So we basically said, hey, it's difficult, but let's basically, I say for my sins, this is the second time I've started up my own law firm, so I, I figure that uh, let's, it can't be hard, that hard, can it? Um, in fact, it's been quite interesting because 18 months ago, the, the way of the world was a bit different than it is now, but never mind. 
Um, so I think going to the culture and kind of the passion part about it is, I think, yes, the brand basically was us. Now it's becoming Swartz Bindersley because people know that we're passionate about what we do. We're committed to our clients. We're long-term players. And we really want to basically be in it for the long haul. So people don't look at us and say, oh, they've only been around 18 months. So what could they possibly bring? Um, you know, in the law, in the profession, um, you have to have knowledge, you have to have experience. And probably when it comes to fintech work, bragging a little bit, yes, I am. Um, I, I would say that we've had as much or more experience than most of the big firms. Nigel's been around 35 years. I've been here 24. So um, I think our uh, passion towards the business is what basically drove us into setting up on doing our own thing. As you said, the logos, the letterhead, it all comes later. Um, but going to the culture, I think then you have to basically live it, believe it, be it. Um, I wouldn't say that, you know, sometimes it's been particularly easy, but I've had to make some hard decisions, as everyone can appreciate, in the last 12 months. Um, Hong Kong's had its, uh, had its you know, um, more difficult times than in the last 24 years I've been here. Uh, but it's also then brought us together, and I think it's brought us a culture, our clients and our um, employees basically knowing that we care about them, we basically are here again for the long term and that we're trying to make sure everybody's got work so everyone can basically take care of their families as well. So I think you have to basically lead with purpose and I think you have to have a purpose and you have to be very clear about what that purpose is. Yeah. So I think when we set up, um, we, we were very clear about where we wanted to go and what we wanted to be. We want to be the preeminent boutique law firm focusing in fintech, corporate finance and, and disputes. And, and then the rest of it, I think after that was pretty, I wouldn't say easy, but it's uh, been challenging, but it, it's very clear where we want to be and where we want to go. Mm. Uh, that's a fantastic story, and I'm, I'm so excited to have you on stage today because it's it's such an important story to tell about how you, you manage through hardship and make it a successful outcome. Um, Karen, I, I think um, you and W Hub obviously are very closely associated with, with the branding of passion and um, the energy and drive that you, you have as a team uh, is very contagious. Um, it also gives the impression um, that it has been a pretty easy ride. Um, but I know from some long evenings um, that that's definitely not the case. So can you talk a little bit around some of the challenges that you have encountered? Firstly, as an individual when you were starting your company, but also as you kind of moved along in establishing your culture and your presence in the Hong Kong market. So it's, it's definitely a, a challenging journey. Like there is no doubt about this. You know, you, you hear stories about tech companies and every time in the press you feel like it's so easy, right? So why don't everybody just, just do it? So the truth is that with, without the passion and, and you know, that you see actually from all of us here, right? And uh, that's the only thing that can really keep you going. Setting up it is hard. You start with a new idea, people will not only challenge it, but just tell you that it's impossible. You know, why are you doing it? It's never gonna work. I tried it myself. Okay, okay, let's just, you know, let's just focus. So setting up, it's like, you know, super hard and, and difficult getting your first customers is also really quite a challenge. And then you have, you know, to switch from like being just, just two, from like, you know, growing a team and leading a team, which is also something that is quite challenging. So, so definitely. Uh, on top of it, you know, being like two women, you often get the, the questions about how do you manage family life and business life. Yeah, okay, ask my husband um, or ask any guy on, on the panel, <laughs> which you never do. So a, a lot of challenges and then comes like fundraising. And, and fundraising is like really hard as well. And at, at the beginning, it really relies on, on you, like the funding team. It, people invest, especially at the beginning, in people mm. so it's true that the first one that you're gonna get it's definitely that's why we call it family and friends right mm. it's people that that know news that's why you know it's gonna take a, a, a really long time and that's definitely really challenging so we've been quite lucky actually to find really like the right partners that were actually people that you know we knew from from before and that can really help us to push it to the next level um, so, so, so yeah, it's been a, a, a challenging journey and every step actually comes with new problems, but I'm just uh, super optimistic. Uh, I mean, we've been through like so many crises. I used to be an, an equity derivative trader during like 2008. So I've, I've seen a lot of different type of crises, but the truth is that in every crisis are opportunities. 
everything you know that you do every challenge that you do and I'm, I'm a trail runner right so I love to do like 20k 30k 50 100 and and the truth is that in all of this you find that you are so full of resources mm -hmm. and and I think this is really what keeps us going and and that's why we are full of energy and and passion because it's your fuel it's it's really your your drivers so you don't want to talk about you know all the problem that you have and all the challenges you know what you want to talk about is is your vision you know the thing that you want to do that you want to set up and and that's really the amazing thing and i'm sure juliet is the same way i'm not sure you actually celebrate your success as well right which we'll never do as entrepreneur because we're always looking at you know the next step but yeah, it's, it's definitely challenging, but it's, it's worth it. And what's not, one last point is that we always talk about the founders, but back again, you know, it's really all about the people and the team. As Simon Sinek says, you know, it's first uh, about the people and, and they are the one also that are fueling you with, with energy and that are following you and, and making it possible. So I have on stage uh, with me two women that are fully driven by purpose and passion and an extremely growth mindset. And Juliette, you're on the Zoom, so we can see you live. Um, do you want to talk about the challenges that you've encountered? I'm sure they're very similar to what Christy and Karen have encountered. We would love to hear from, from you how you have gone on your journey uh, to becoming where you are today. Um, I think the, the journey is definitely a very interesting one. Um, but I got to say, um, uh, it's better than before when I was 26, when I first engaged in the startup world. And now Gossip is my third startup. So some of the things I anticipated, um, but with this one very rooted in Hong Kong, I think what I've seen, uh, one of the toughest parts is actually getting the right talent on board. Um, by what I mean by right talent on board is that um, they are very smart. Hong Kong have a lot, a lot of smart people. Um, but I feel sometimes when we uh, try to hire the right person, um, there are a lot of uh, things to come with them, unfortunately, because the Hong Kong living environment is really pretty tough comparatively when, when we started in Thailand and, and, and all. Um, so that makes it pretty hard. So a lot of the talent people, talented people, whether they're graduates or with five, 10 years experience, um, because of the bills they need to pay up is actually, I think this is one of the toughest part to get the best talent on board comparing to all the other countries. And as, 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 as Karen said, people are the most integral, integral part, not just the skills, but with the right mentality. So uh, I think this one is kind of like finding your love whenever you interview someone and then love wins, right? <laughs> and, and once you actually build a very good team, a lot of things are, are, are e much easier because whenever you have a challenges, whether at work, I'm sure all of us do, whether you get the right partners on board, whether I got off the call with a retailer and end up with a contract or not, at the end of the day, what keeps us going um, are, are the passions of a group of people. And we get it going sometimes, it's just a smile, sometimes with a laugh, sometimes with a beer. But at the end of the day, we come right back up tomorrow, tomorrow morning and let's go again, you know? Um, so I think this is the hardest challenge I, I feel. And, and currently my, my company is not that big, uh, around 30 people and 10 of them are probably expats and 20 of, uh, 20 of them are, are, are locals. And, and I'm extremely blessed to be able to find this group of, uh, of uh, people join, joining us. Um, if I feel the Hong Kong situation and the bills are not, the living standard is not so high, there will be a lot more talents that I find and come across that will be wanting to jump on board. You almost see the, the, the love in the eyes that they literally want to, but they also have like bills to pay for the parents and, you know, like loans of student loans and, and stuff like that, which is not entirely startup friendly uh, at the moment. So I think this is definitely one of the toughest part. I find that if the company is in Hong Kong, um, that's, the, that's the tough part, huh? Yeah, yeah. Hey, and Juliette, have you encountered any specific challenges when you were going out for funding? So do you think it makes a different in, a difference in the current environment, maybe not the current environment, but under normal circumstances, whether you're a female founder or a male founder? And, and how have you tackled that for gossip? Um, yeah, that, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think uh, this is the global phenomenon 
female founders definitely, I don't know about others that we tend to find a bit difficult to, to get fundraising on the same level as male founders. Um, uh, I think majority uh, is, is the fact that um, one, whether uh, we, we actually work, I feel, if I'm speaking for all three of you as well, we work ultra hard, we work 120% as probably just to be seen as, you know, on par with male. Um, and, and, and obviously I have a diverse team, don't get me wrong, it's not just all women in, in gossip, right? Um, but I think in terms of funding environment, the female part might not pull me back as much. But rather than that, the Hong Kong part pulled me back a little bit. Um, comparing to all the other uh, countries, uh, first thing, I think a Hong Kong startup would be seen as that oh, Hong Kong is pretty small, you know, and the, the demographic, even though you max out to 7 million people in Hong Kong, it's still so small and they are not wrong. That's the thing. <laughs> that, that's one part that I agree with them, like Hong Kong is small. But then if you look at and know Hong Kong much deeper, the disposable income is really high. It's a very, very unique place where you can't really find it anywhere else. So, um, so I think that part takes some negotiation and, 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 and I need them to understand, yeah, this is the first country we choose to start because it can prove you the, the, the brand concept and also the product fee. And then when it does that, the scale up part is not too bad. Um, and it's actually a very uh, strong uh, 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 stone to set on. Uh, if I still choose it again, I will still choose it here. But that part, I think, is a bit difficult to, to penetrate in terms of the investment eyes. Mm. But you raise a very interesting point, because I guess if there is a, a challenge that you need to convince others, you need to make sure that your pitch is, is perfect, right? Uh, that you effectively articulate uh, and try and understand what the investors and funders are looking for and try and anticipate to that. So maybe I can pose that question maybe to Christy because you obviously support a lot of companies as well. And, and how do you see them tackling that? And what, would, what kind of advice would you give uh, for companies that are, that are looking to raise money? Right. So, you know, we would always say as a lawyer, you know, you're going to speak to me now or you're going to speak to me later, but it's much cheaper if you speak to me now. So um, we would always say from a, from a founders or from a, from a startup perspective, you know, we're very much willing, we're a startup ourselves, let's be honest. And we, we know the struggles, we know the pain points that people face. Um, but if you're looking at it from a maybe fintech perspective or even just basically a startup perspective, you know, you've got to have your house in order. And I think the fact is, is that as Karen rightly said, you know, when, when we, we have in, represent investors, investors looking to buy companies, they're going to say, yes, it's about the people initially, but then it's like, do you have yourself, do you have your house in order? Because if you don't have your house in order, it doesn't matter what I do for you. You can't, you know, I can't take that, you know, for you. Um, so I think one of the best things we could say is get yourself set up early, um, make sure and take some initial advice. I mean, there's a lot of us out there who basically are willing to give free advice um, and just say, you know, these are some things you need to think about. And we work with the client. Like I said, we're team players. We're long-term players. Yeah, I've been here 24 years. Um, I, I'd like to take the approach that, you know, um, don't be penny wise and pound foolish. But um, I do think that sometimes investors, especially some of the areas we look at, reg the regulated space and the regulatory compliance, um, you know, that stuff can get you, it's fairly trickly, tricky. Um, it's, it's very complicated. And, you know, if you're not careful, you can find your find yourself in front of the uh, SFC or HKMA fairly quickly on, on you know, enforcement or infringement areas. So, um, you know, we always say, you know, be careful, be cautious. And I know the dollars are, are very, very precious because uh, we would know that too. We're very much in the same, same boat. Um, but I think put yourself in order, make sure you've got a good team. I think Juliet mentions that as well. You've got to have a good team behind you because eventually it does move off of being all about you. It does move on to being uh, about the firm, what the firm does um, and what the, it represents and what it can do and its expertise. So I think you just have to basically keep your house in good order. And that's, that's super hard as a startup. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Karen, so you've seen a lot of companies coming through W Hub, a lot of hackathons, uh, a lot of pitches. So can you tell me a little bit what you've seen as common pitfalls and kind of advice you would want to give to a lot of people that are watching this today around how they can actually improve on, on their pitching and their presentation and, and their branding of both themselves and the company? 
Yeah, I, I think, yeah, definitely we, we've seen a lot and, and with Angel Hub, we, we've already received like over like 1,000 applications over the past year. So, so definitely, and with our global startup competition that we organize over like 12 countries just before COVID, thanks God, um, we, we've definitely seen a lot. Um, I, I think w one thing is that, you know, I, I don't want you to, to talk to me too much about everything related to technical thing and, and the problem, you know, it's like when you're playing Super Mario. Okay, I'm I've born in the 80s, okay? Um, it's not about the flower, it's about throwing fireballs. Okay, like, like show me like exactly what you're doing, okay? I'm really not interested in these flowers, but when you show me what you can solve, this is really like the good thing. And, and also because you need to talk about your team, your product, of course, everything related to technique, how you're gonna grow. I mean, we all know what you need to talk into your pitch. So just talk about it. Don't avoid one topic because you know, you know it's, that's your weak point. Yeah. And especially when you're an early stage company, of course you're not perfect. It's like if you were, like you would not be pitching for this, okay? You will be already like a unicorn. So, you know, know what are your problems, ask for the help, you know, point them out as well, because this really, really, really helps. Yeah. So if I digest that a little bit, what you're effectively saying, make sure you're authentic and credible um, and don't sugarcoat, uh, let's say, any of the issues that you have. And also, please, I mean, put numbers in, you know, like showing me like amazing graph without any numbers, you know, doesn't mean nothing. And we're, we're going to go and, and ask you about it just, just after. So, you yeah. know, just speak the truth. Yeah. So just on authenticity, uh, Juliette, I know um, it's uh, from personal experience and having also been very passionate for many years about female empowerment that there is still a bit of a challenge, I guess, for women to be very authentic because either on the one hand, they would be seen as uh, too aggressive, but on the other hand, uh, they could be seen as too being too warm and too nice and too motherly and, and cuddly. Um, so how, and thankfully the, the three here, I can, I can share that that's not the case. Um, but could you share with me how you, if you have experienced that and what you would advise um, young founders and, and, start, and older startup founders as well um, around how they can be authentic without kind of um, overwhelming or overpowering their own values? Yeah, I think, uh, well, I have to say is grow with age. Uh, when I look back at how I was doing it when I was 26 and now, uh, it's rather different as you, you grow with different experience in life and teach you how to conduct even your, your pitches and, and all that and how you come across it yourself differently. And I suppose the one who reads you, would we can see that the fire in the 27 years old might not be less than the the one, the older one, but it's actually a different kind of fire. They are probably maybe a bit more assured um, and, and with plans and all that. But I, I, I think by all means, it's got to be genuine though. Like if you come across a little bit more fiery when you are 25, then, then this is probably how you were. And then some people might see it as a really good thing that, wow, I see like a, a fireball, like a Kalesi in a, 2025 20, and then and then they may really like it for the one who really like it then they will really like it so it's hard to be not to be genuine about it is as the especially if you get a an investor that they carry you and with you in the journey for a couple of years um yeah. so so it's got to be really that that you get to know the person for a few years so it's hard to mask anything you might just as well if you are being aggressive then then grow because part of it, I think you, you will get to learn from it and they will see the change. There's no good or bad in there. Um, I'm probably still very fiery in most of the circumstances like, like fair versus my 26 years old and still, still how it is. Karen, eh? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I guess uh, that's a great, uh, a, a great fire to have. So keep going. But you actually really mentioned something really interesting around using that, um, that authenticity to also connect with the right partners, right? And you spoke also about investors. So how, how do you identify the right investors for your company? Oh, this is super interesting because I think actually so far uh, we have never really got much VC 
type of people invest into gossip, like just one mm. um, in Thailand. But majority of our shareholders are actually billionaires, if not family offices, where the founder of the conglomerate is actually an entrepreneur itself 50 years ago. And when you speak mm. to entrepreneur, you actually resonate very differently. You, you talk about the dirty stuff that really like very upfront within the first five minutes. And they probably ask you very penetrative questions that you will be like, oh, so you don't want to talk about numbers. You want to see the holes I have in my company, bring it on. Mm. So I think that the, it's very important to be finding genuine partners and be yourself because if they like it, then I think a lot of things down the road have no issue because they invest in you as a person. They probably see, see some part of it like, like in themselves back in the days. And uh, I think that's what is, is, is the best rather than like, oh, we because of the money and we get this on and then we further down the line six months later and we realize our goals doesn't matter. And then, and then you want to focus on whether I give you the right report every week or like you want me to do the job. Like, so it's very different uh, kind of tech, but if you find the right partner, then, then I think the journey will be super smooth. If I, if I may add on this one about finding the, you know, the right investor. So, so first of all, you know, it's, it's the money part and it's good to have the money. So that's already a right investor in, in a way. But I think you know, when, when you're looking for funding, there are a few things that you need to, to check is that, okay, do you align first in terms of timeline, right? When you're doing an investment into an early stage company, it, it might be, you know, five years, seven years down the road, right? So this needs to be like really clear. So you need to align with your investor in terms of, okay, what, what are they looking for in terms of investing in you? Is it to get out in two years, in three years? And then it needs to be clear yeah. from the beginning. Um, do they want to get a lot involved, not a lot involved? Do they have, I, I think really the aim is for also an investor to be there to, open their network for you. That's, that's one thing. And I think, you know, also what we do at Angel Hub is we noticed, and I'm sure like now Juliet is actually an expert, but, but like from like, you know, entrepreneur when they grow, they become fundraising experts. Mm. That's not an entrepreneur's role. No. The entrepreneur's role is to build your company. You know, it's not to be an expert in fundraising. And, and that's really where we want to, to be in terms of helping the startups to you know, to take care also of this part from them in terms of finding also the right investors, not only like for this round, but also you need to think really long-term in terms of the strategy as well. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting point because you also have a question uh, from the floor, um, which particularly focus on fundraising challenges for female founders. And I'm actually gonna direct it to you, Karen, because you obviously see, probably see a, a lot of that in Angel Hub, but the question is actually, you know, would it help uh, if um, if we would actually grow more female angel investors in in the ecosystem? Would it be more beneficial to challenges for female founders? So I, I think you know the answer is like so obvious. We, we live, you know, on on Earth where we have about like fifty percent of female. Right. So it's like if you're asking me, is it worthwhile having like diversity on your team? And, you know, n not only about gender, but uh, it's like about everything. And, and the one thing is that I'm, I'm really like frustrated to say that at Angel Hub, in terms of the, the, the network of professional investors that we have on our platform, it's mainly male. Mm. And of course it will help to have female because mm. it's different point of view, different interest in terms of investment. It's like, okay, do you only want, you know, French people? Do you only mm. want like Hong mm. Kong people? Mm. It's, it's about growing and it's so much more than just about this gender break, but it's the one that you can really see first and maybe also solve first, but definitely, you know, women now, they have also some, so much resources, so they need to be there to invest into the companies of tomorrow. Yeah, but then, but then the, the, the next question that naturally comes from that is why are there no more female investors? And maybe I can ask Chrissy that question, not sure if you know that answer, but... Well, I can make a very nice kind of similarity. Um, so, uh, law school, Hong Kong, 60% um, female uh, population. Uh, when you get out and then you do your training contract, it kind of evens out 50-50. Um, those after the two-year training contract, it goes probably female, male, about 30% continue on. When you get to the partnership level, you've got 4%. Mm. 
And so I, I don't really know kind of when we've, we've talked about many different ways and reasons and means of why this happens. Yeah. Um, but I think, um, and in Hong Kong, we have all the extra support and you know, additional resources. And I think there's a lot of groups that help to this. Women's Foundation does a great job in trying to encourage even at the young age, um, you know, the, the confidence in building, um, you know, women up. So I think the problem is, is that, yes, I mean, Karen's right. Do, you, do we need more women full stop everywhere? Probably that's right. But I think, would it help from a, primarily from an angel investment network? I, I'm kind of gonna be controversial and say, mm. not just only. Mm. I think you need to basically look at this from a, a whole kind of holistic point of view and, and, and look at the whole ecosystem as a you know, whole um, and, and say, look, um, we need to have more women everything. We need to have more people involved in the decision-making process, the diversity. We talk about diversity, but I think the problem is we've talked a lot about it, but I don't think we've had any particularly great outcomes. So I, I wouldn't say that, you know, the investor or the financial um, scene is the only place that we have such um, kind, of just kind of terrible numbers, really. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Juliet, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, I think they actually speak my mind. This is weird. Yeah, and it's very funny because if you, even if I'm just thinking whilst I'm on stage here, thinking about uh, our own She's Next program, which is really about the empowerment of women, um, it's interesting to see that we look at solutions for the female founders, um, whilst actually we should probably look also at what the wider, more systemic issues are in the ecosystem um, that we can help to solve together. Um, I'm just going to bring it, we have a few more minutes left, I'm just going to bring it back to branding um, and um, just want to hear your views, particularly because there is now so much more opportunity to brand yourself, but I, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, maybe Karen to kick it off. So what advice would you have for a startup um, that is looking to brand itself? And you have obviously very little budget and as Christy already acknowledge you either have to make a decision on whether you spend your money on branding or on your legal costs. So assuming you're going to bring a lot of business to Christy, let's, uh, let's assume you don't have a lot of budget. So what is your best bet to kind of reach out? What would be your strategy? Okay, first you register on WHUB because it's free. Okay, so that's definitely one way to get a lot of visibility for sure. Uh, I, I think the, the first thing is really to get your, your mission and, and your vision straight. Uh, that, that's really the first point. Then after you have so many ways to express yourself on social media before even you need to pay um, in order to get more visibility. So once you decide you know, to go on one social media or the other, depending on who you are targeting, that, that's really where you, you start. Uh, I think you know, when we're talking about branding and, and maybe like design, these kind of things will come, but it's, it's really key to say, like, okay, what do you want to achieve? And, and really what is, you know, your, your key sentences to, to describe your, your, your business first and, and the rest will come. I mean, when I've met Juliet, she really just started out and, and she was very clear on what she wanted to do. And that's really how she manages to, to, to get herself out there. And, and I think the one advice is don't be shy. You know, don't be shy, get challenged, get, get out there and then it will come and you'll find the best, best way to do it. Okay, but get out there. Where do you go? LinkedIn, you, you have so many social media and, and then you have so many events and, and conference and now online. So you really have a, a lot of ways to, to express yourself. You, you want to be a speaker, you know, you have your own expertise that you need to show, you know, find it and, and contact like all the people that are organizing conference, for example, about it. Reach out to your LinkedIn network, you know, with a really personalized message. Please stop sending me messages about, I want to pick up your brain and, and something that, you know, you send to like everybody, you know, take the time actually to, to make special messages out there. And, and that's really the way to do it when you put effort into it. I, I really like your slip of the tongue to say, uh, you, I want you to pick up my brain. <laughs> um, you know, don't, don't you receive a lot of messages like that? <laughs> uh, Juliette, can you also share, because obviously you've been on an incredible journey for the last three years. Um, what advice would you give a company that has very limited marketing budget? What, are, what is the best way to kind of get your brand out there um, in this current environment? Um, I think, first of all, uh, as a startup founder, we juggle with how to use our money here and there. But I got to be, um, say honestly one thing and probably give 
more business to the beautiful lady on the right, where um, do soy our legal stuff very early on. Like that really goes a long way. And I think um, a lot of founders might think, oh, if we have a business that, I mean, if I have uh, some sales, then, then we focus on it later. And then nine out of 10 times, you usually find that it's probably too late already. Um, but, but still, I'm not saying that spend every money and dollars and just start working with a good lawyer because you come across a lot of things that they actually touch the part with, with legal, your contracts, like your employee contracts, like everything is related to it. And then, and then sometimes it's a, if you have a crappy employee contract, that doesn't spell trust to the first person you want to hire either. You know, um, so, so that part needs to be looked after. So while marketing money and all the others are important, treat the people first. And if somehow it goes back to, you know, like, 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 like the contract that I, that I talk about. But then obviously you, you spend some money on your, on your branding um, to, to see. And, and I think the testing part is really important. Don't go fully, um, uh, go on to, to, to be completely optimistic because every founder are optimistic, especially they, they think this is going to be flying, but, but probably discount 70% of it. So assuming that if your startup doesn't fly 70% of what your KPI that you want to look at, it's just still you know, acceptable to you. If it's not, then, then you need to change because the, the, the fall through, I can really see 60, 70%. And I'm quoting from a gossip early days where we have like over, over 600,000 downloads on App Store, we have zero sales. So, and I'm like, right, how does that even happen? Like, like I spent a fortune and everyone downloading, playing at it, zero sales. So, and then I think like that, that brings a message that it will fell through. But so giving back to my point is that do sort your legal rights. That's the first branding. The first ambassador you need to look after is your employee. Okay. I'm just going to ask one question because it just popped up when we were talking about legal branding. So how important has it been for you also to trademark your, your brand name? And I can ask that uh, to, to Karen as well, but did you actually spend any money on doing that early on? Uh, probably not early enough because I was the one that's still making the mistake that saw this kind of stuff out later. Um, but, but then I learned my lesson, but I was very lucky as well that we didn't get into too much trouble, but some of the trademarks that we start to have our first series A, and then you all of a sudden realize it's been acquired. Well, I'm not, I'm sure that no one will be interested to acquire that until I get my series A, right? So I did make my mistake, but I think sensibly at least trademark one of the country that you're currently dominantly to prove the, to prove that you are, you know, set the foot in it. Um, but don't spend the fortune yet to acquire the worldwide trademark to anticipate that your, glo your, your start will go global that soon. Yeah, I, I think everything related to, to legal really does matter. I mean, uh, Angel Hub is, is regulated by the SFC, so, uh, you know, there, there is no... <laughs> it's not funny, actually, but, you know, it, my, my lawyer became one of my best friends, so, you know, <laughs> we know, like, how, how this actually happened, right? Uh, so, so, definitely, it's, it's one thing that, that, is, that is really key, even as a young company. It, it, and it's also one thing in terms of due diligence that we do at Angel Hub in terms of all this, like, HR thing, you know, trademark, and having everything in order is, like, really key from the start. You cannot go start fundraising before, as, as we said before, having your house in orders. And, and that's also why, you know, we don't do anything related to, to legal matters. That's why we work actually with lawyers. And that's why I recommend to every companies, you need to do it. Please don't download templates. Spend $2,000 on lawyers in order to get it right. Because then after you go into litigation and, and problems like that, and it's gonna cost you a fortune. This is the easiest panel ever I've been yeah, on. Exactly. I love you all. <laughs> So I'm like, uh, Christy, what kind of non-legalistic advice do you have to, uh, to female founders? Around right. this? I'm going to go back a little bit, uh, Micah, to your question about well, how can you do it on a budget? Because that's exactly how we have yep. to do it. You know, yep. We are a law firm, so thankfully we do yep. kind of look after people first and we believe in that totally and wholly. Um, but I would say that you have to be true to yourself. I think Karen said it, um, Juliette said it, you have to be true to yourself and what you represent and be very clear about what you represent as well. So I don't think in that respect, it's any different being a lawyer or a law firm than, than a, a startup company. Um, I think the other thing though, is that's a little bit different. People pay um, for our services because of our knowledge and mm. or experience. 
And I think the fact is, is that we talk about women not being particularly great at marketing ourselves. And I think that's one thing that is, stands true even in the legal profession. Um, so you have to get out there. What I mean by get out there, we write articles, we speak at events. Are we gonna be paid dollar for dollar for this? No, we're not. But the fact is, is that we're real believers and if you give to the community, the community will give back to you. Um, so we're very big uh, proponents of getting out um, and being part of the community. Um, the other aspect of it too is I think is, is, is great branding. And I don't do it because I say, oh wow, yeah, it's great that we do all these things. I truly believe that you ought to give back to the community in which you're living. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been here 24 years and I make it a point at the firm. I said, you know, we need to do pro bono, but we also need to do community service. So I'm not gonna sit here and dictate what you wanna do, but I, I kind of insist, but don't insist, but insist that everyone in the firm has to basically have something that they'd like to give back in the community, whether it be serving the FinTech Association. Um, I sit on Faith and Love Foundation. We teach English at an um, orphanage on Monday nights. Whatever you want to do, I yeah. think it's a very important part of what we do because you know we're very, very lucky and fortunate to be in this place called Hong Kong, which is, I think, the greatest place on the planet. And I think we're very lucky because if you hold your hand up and ask for help, there are a lot of people that are really willing to give their time and, and their efforts in, in helping you succeed. So, um, you know, I think in that respect, you just have to get out there. You have to write articles, show that you're knowledgeable, show that you care. Yeah. I mean, you can't fake it. I mean, that, there's no faking it anymore. I mean, the thing with social media that's great is that there's no faking it anymore. People actually know if you're uh, uh, in it or not. So I think the fact is, is that you just have to be true to yourself and then be very clear in where you want to end up. Yeah. Yeah, so to recap, we spoke about being authentic. We need to be credible. Credible. So I think you can do that by actually building on, on your knowledge and sharing that with others. And then I think caring is, is something fantastic because it makes you feel good as an individual, but it also really helps build your company culture and feed your purpose. And I, I'm totally with you, uh, Christy. I really think that you know the best way that we can actually give back is to the community that we, we live in. Um, but thankfully, there is also a little bit of a helping hand, and I just want to go back to, to Juliet as well to say, um, yeah, if you're fake, people will punch through it straight away, um, but obviously there's also a lot of digital support and digital tools that you can use with your branding. Um, would you mind sharing uh, maybe your top tip uh, for any company out there on on what you use and what has been successful for you to drive your, your sales. So I find it super interesting that you mentioned you had 60,000 downloads, uh, and, but it was very hard to actually um, com convert that into a sale. So have, do you, have you figured out any interesting tools that people could benefit from to, to leverage off that? Well, um, I think the sad news is we have 600,000 downloads and zero sales instead of 60, which is even makes me okay. wanting to cry at the time. <laughs> <laughs> now it became a love now. Um, so in terms of the tools, uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of things that we, we leverage and piggyback on, um, especially from our online platform that uh, to, to, to use on it for free for quite some time. To be honest, I think the first one that have never been paid on by, by tracking our users and stuff is actually Google Analytics. Um, it's been incredibly useful uh, for us to, to, to track it and only later on where we need to track something even more in-depth than we have some other pay services to do that. And then uh, a lot of uh, uh, other uh, WHUB actually First, when, when back in the days, we, we signed up and posting our, our, our um, uh, hiring um, profiles and all that stuff online, the job, job ads. Um, and I, I remember even we participated in the, in the, in the event that hiring uh, a lot of uh, uh, good people. Um, so I think just to name one or two without getting into two technicals, there's, there's a lot of them that we can leverage for free. Um, unfortunately, not the lawyers one. Um, but that's where I think you need to spend every money. I think it's definitely worth, worth a lot uh, on doing that. But other than that, I think some of the standard stuff, like um, we facilitate a lot of our chats and, and conference with our US and UK uh, retailers and stuff via Skype and even via some free versions of chat rooms and stuff. Um, as much as we can save money, founders definitely on it, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Karen, anything to add? Any big uh, hack that you can share? 
No, I, I think it's uh, from, from the beginning to use uh, a lot of free tools out there like uh, Airtable, uh, Asana, actually to make sure that, you know, the, the team is, is on track with each other. Yeah. So that people are not working just, you know, on, on their side without like, like sharing what they do and which makes really communication internally easier is, is really key from the start before mm -hmm. it gets really messy and, and a little bit everywhere as, as you grow. Yeah. yeah. So Christy and I are not probably from the Mario Bros generation, but more from the Pac-Man generation. Yes. So um, Christy, in, in, in the legal industry, in your law firm, is there, is there anything that has really helped you kind of engage better with clients that you, that you want to talk about? Um, I think the best way you can engage with clients, again, is like, be real, be honest, um, tell them what you do. Don't tell them, yes, we can do everything, because I think more and more these days, people are basically really not generalist. They're really specialized, maybe not too specialized, but um, I do think that you have to be honest with your capabilities. Um, and so I think when, when you're basically working with clients and when you're working with a lawyer, you have to say, these are my issues and these are my pain points. It's like going to the doctor. It doesn't mm. do you any good to kind of sit there and say, I am fine. I'm just kind of coming to say hi. Thanks. Yeah. Well, so how are you? Um, it doesn't quite help us and it doesn't help you get where you need to go. Um, but I think when you basically think about how to market a brand or put yourself out there, um, you, you need to be knowledgeable as well. So again, gone are the days, as you say, you punch through it. Gone are the days of trying to be the journalist that can do everything and that can, you know, kind of fake the way through it. Um, I think that's super hard, especially when you're dealing with very complicated, at least what we do, complicated and complex problems, um, platforms, uh, you know, anything around uh, very, a lot of different laws in Hong Kong and, and elsewhere. So I think, you know, the thing about it is, is that, again, you just have to, like I always say, you have to have to come to Jesus, talk with yourself and say, self, who are you and who do you want to be? And then basically, as long as you're good with that, I think that's basically a pretty good place to start. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So we're done to the final, uh, we're down to the final three minutes. Uh, so maybe just one final word of advice from all of you. So Juliette, uh, Karen, Christy, thank you very much. But before you go, can you just give me one sentence of advice uh, for the people that are uh, zooming in today uh, to this uh, Startup Impact Summit? Juliette, you wanna kick it off? Yeah, um, I think I uh, live by the motto, don't ever give up what you want. Usually what you want is on the other side of fear. Ah, I like it. Very good. Wow. <laughs> wow. wow. How to, how to wow. follow that. I love it. Uh, you know, I would say, you know, like, first of all, uh, be true to yourself and, and get surrounded by people that lift you up. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and I think that's uh, really how... I think I've managed to survive like all these years, actually, we're talking about challenges, but you know, being with, with Karina is really the one thing that, um, that, that made me grow. So be surrounded by the right people. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to add to that because I was going to use actually Karen and Karina as a great example. Um, surround yourself by people that basically lift you up, but also compliment you. You don't have, you know, all of the same people uh, in the room don't really probably progress your uh, ambitions too far. And I think Karen and Karina are a great example of that. They, they complement each other. Um, they basically know what everyone's doing, but they still basically mm. know what the other part is, 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 is you know, um, I guess having equal balance in, in the relationship as well. So they, I think that's the most important is you've got to surround yourself with people that you can trust and people that balance you and, and basically make you um, energized and want to basically come to work every day. It's a hard job. Well, with that, uh, thank you so much for being on my panel today thank and you. being around thank me. Thank you. And thank me you up so and much. Energy and very positive vibes. Um, it was awesome to have you on stage. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the summit and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.